we launched a new series entitled, Where It Started. I don't know if you've ever seen those memes, where it started, where it is now. Uh, you know, the, the popular ones are like the marriage ones, where it started. And her, they've got their like champagne on honeymoon and then where it is now. And the mother's hair is all like this, you know, one kid's holding on here, dad's trying to clean up dog poop on the corner. And, and it's like, it, it doesn't end up the way it started. And we were speaking about how in our walk with Jesus so often, the way it started is not the way it kind of is experienced later on. That often what started is serving and getting involved with delight suddenly becomes a duty. Suddenly the idea of getting into the Word and enjoying the adventure of getting to know God becomes this religious obligation. And if we had to have a meme around our spiritual lives, it would probably be something similar to one of those marriage memes. Where it started, where it is now. Uh, And so we were aware that that principle can apply in our experience with God. And so the series was called Where It Started, Living From Our First Love Today. And as we started last week, we explored in the New Testament book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 2, where Jesus commends one of the early churches in Ephesus for its work. And the author John writes, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. I'm like, that list is what every Christian strives for. I want to persevere. I want to grow. I want to stick by truth and not be deceived. I'm like, man, I've got my Christianity right But then suddenly in verse 4, Jesus continues and says, But I have this against you. You've departed from your first love. When Jesus told the church in Ephesus that they had lost their first love, he was saying you're doing all the deeds right because of what you know in your head, but you've lost sight of knowing me experientially from your heart. Losing our first love happens when our intellectual understanding of knowing about God overtakes our intimate experience of knowing in relationship with God. And too often, we share the testimony of an experience we once had with God in the past, intellectualizing the rest of our faith walk from that memory instead of experiencing God in new moments. It's like, yo, well, let me share my testimony. This one time, yo, and I just felt the presence of God. And, and we talk from that moment in the past and intellectualize the rest in learning about God and what we should do and what we shouldn't do and how to be a good Christian and how to pray and what I'm going to say and how I do all these things. And, and, and we lose sight of continuing to experience those moments. Often we... What started as an experience with God is sustained through an intellectual understanding of God. We do need both. But at the core, God wants love before the law. And so we asked the question last week, how can we then draw a wandering heart closer to our first love again? And we discovered the answer in God's response to the church in Ephesus from Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, where Jesus says, after explaining that we had lost first love, these things, he's like, so because you've lost your first love and must return, remember the heights from which you've fallen and repent. Change your inner self, your old way, your thinking, your sinful behavior. Seek God's will and do the works you did at first when you first knew me. So there are three things that Jesus says we should do in coming back to our first love. He says we need to remember, repent, and then return. And it starts with the instruction to remember. Remember the heights from which you have fallen. When Jesus says remember the heights from which you've fallen, he isn't wanting you to remember the failures you've fallen into since your first love. He's wanting you to remember the depths from which you've been raised because he first loved you. You see, last week we landed by speaking about the fact that in Scripture, we don't only have Jesus telling the church to remember. 
We also have a moment where a thief hanging on the cross next to Christ asked to be remembered. And we spoke about how the thief said, Lord, remember me when you go into your kingdom. We recognized how the thief had an intellectual understanding of the claims of this man being the Savior. Now suddenly he was having an experience in the presence of the Savior as he hung next to him on the cross. This time he didn't relate to him based on information about him. He responded on information about his experience with him. And he said, Lord, remember me. Jesus said to the church, remember me your first love. The thief said, remember me. And and then Jesus said to the man, I will. We spoke about how profound that was because this man never had the opportunity to earn God's approval. He could never reconcile for all the things he had done that were so wrong leading to his punishment of crucifixion. And when he would be remembered by God, he would go to heaven with the memory of that moment in which he found his first love. God wouldn't go back and say, well, I remember all the other things you did. Today, to the thief, I will remember you in this moment and you will be with me in paradise. And when we reflected on that, we concluded saying that you are held in God's memory as his first love in this moment. Therefore, Jesus invites you to live from the memory of your first love with him in every moment too. We spoke about how when God sees that photo shot of you, it's like the sinner in that moment. He was remembered worthy of being with Christ, not for all the things he had done wrong. How often do we start in that moment? We come to know Jesus. Woo! It feels good. Praise Jesus. We're on fire. And then suddenly through the years, we stuff up. We mess up here. We didn't do what we should have. The Bible says this, but we did that. And suddenly that first love, passion disappears because we begin to see ourselves as less than worthy of being the saints we thought we were called to be under Christ. And the whole time, God is not going back to remember all the mistakes. He continues seeing the masterpiece he saw on that first day. And so we said that you are held in God's memory as his first love in this moment. Therefore, Jesus invites you to live from the memory of your first love with him every moment too. So first we're told to remember, as God impressed this on my heart, it's a very difficult topic to preach about because I can preach and give you five key points to apply in finding your first love but it's not that simple because we might just fall back into doing what the church in Ephesus was doing and get the deeds done well and still remain far from our first love. I want us to press into the subject and simply allow ourselves to sit in the space for a season. And so today, again, I'm just gonna press further into the significance of finding our first love rather than giving you five points to apply if you wanna come back to your first love. Because what will happen is you will leave today and then you will try hard. And in a few months' time, we'll forget about this. You'll be back to your old ways and feel so bad for not getting it right. So first we're told to remember. And then Jesus says, repent. And for those that aren't Christian, it's Christianese for change your mind. Okay, so it's like, change your mind. Remember me and then change the way you think. Have a shift in your mind. And we see that pastor and author Craig Rochelle says of the mind these words. He says, if both the Bible and modern science teach us that our lives are moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts, then we need to ask ourselves, do I like the direction my thoughts are taking me in? Jesus knows this. He says, hey, when you think stuff, it actually determines the direction of your life. So hey, dude, you're not repentance is. It's changing your mind where your thoughts are toxic and taking you to places you don't want to be. So repentance, which is changing your mind, changes the direction of your life, and this is what repentance is all about, changing your mind and turning back to the direction of my first love once again. That's what Jesus is saying. Hey, I want you to remember some stuff, and then I want you to have a mind shift, and that mind shift is helping you change your direction back to pursuing your first love over and above everything else, including the law. 
There's this moment in the New Testament book of Luke chapter 7 verse 47 where Jesus says of the sinful woman that had returned to him to worship him after an, an initial encounter, encounter with him. And she now brings perfume to, to pour on his feet and she bows. And, and while they're in this moment and some of the people are confused, like how is he so happy with the sinner at his feet, uh, undignified, wiping his feet with her hair in tears. They would tie their hair up or keep it covered. And this woman just out there. She's returned a second time to Christ and she's just giving every part of herself to him as she, as she bows at his feet. And so Jesus says this, he says, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven for she loved much. Like, hey, the reason she's so passionately undignified, falling at my feet, pouring the expensive perfume in worship is because of the depth of Sin, she is aware she's been forgiven of. He says, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. Now let's not forget Jesus in explaining how to return to our first love said, remember the heights from which you have fallen. He said, remember, not so we would feel shame for how far we've fallen from our first love, but so that we would recognize how deeply we are forgiven. Then he says, now, after recognizing how deep my forgiveness goes in remembrance, repent. Now change your mind and adjust your direction back towards me. This sinful woman that Jesus referred to as being forgiven much didn't run from Jesus in shame, but toward him with deep love inspired from the depth of his forgiveness. And she remembered how far she had fallen. She was like, I encountered him, I walked away, but I have fallen so far. How deep is his forgiveness? And something changed in her mind. And she redirected herself back and returned with a deeper devotion and gratitude than she had had before. She had encountered Jesus in some way before, it was now returning with tears of gratitude and a sacrifice of deeper devotion. You see, when you and I return to our first love, we don't return the same way as when we left. We return with an even deeper experience of love than before. The dangerous thing is that so often we hear this idea of returning to our first love, then we make an altar call and you all run forward crying, get on your knees because you know how much you've backslid and then you try to promise to God you're gonna find your first love again. Then you go out tonight and you read a whole portion of the Bible that you haven't read in years. You put worship on in the car on your way to work together. By the end of the week, you've fallen back into your old ways because you've thought somehow it's about doing all that stuff. Because you've been bad, so you're coming back, oh, I'm sorry, I messed up. The preacher preached about first love. I'm returning, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have. No. no. Returning to your first love is not about you going back because of how badly you failed. God can work all things for the good, and so even in the midst of what's led you to perhaps drift far from God, He can work things, meaning He can grow you through instead of you just going through, and then when you return to him, it's not in shame as a father stands there angry and ready to give you a good talking. It's to a father with open arms, to a child which has discovered how deep his love is based on the fact that no matter how far I am, you continue waiting for my return. Think about the early disciples and their journey with Jesus. They experienced what we could call three stages in their walk with God, and it's similar to how we experience relationship with Jesus today. So in the first phase of their experience, they encounter Jesus in the flesh. He calls them to follow him, and they watch in amazement as he performs miracles and, pro and gives them promises of, of the powers of Rome being defeated victoriously through his coming. They start dreaming about the coming victory Christ has promised them. And at one stage in their passion and enthusiasm, they begin arguing over who was Jesus' favorite. 
Oh, this is so cool. I think I'm his favorite. No, I am. This is like honeymoon phase. Power of God, we're gonna defeat Rome. Yeah, the Jewish people are gonna be reconciled. This was the promised Messiah. They're dreaming about it. You know, they're drawing little sketches in their book. What are you doing? Oh, just thinking about Jesus. Oh, I just love him so much. We're gonna conquer everyone. I'm his favorite. They were in a honeymoon phase right here. And then they entered another phase where their initial passion and commitment began to dwindle. Jesus began to speak of death and sacrifice and the uncomfortable topic of humble service. The honeymoon period of their first love was lost. Jesus was then led to the cross and one of his disciples who had claimed undying devotion in the first phase of the honeymoon now denied him for fear of persecution. From joyous passion, believing God's promises, they were now cowering in terror. And then the third stage they experienced was when Jesus was crucified and it seemed to his disciples that he had been defeated, that the God they had started following with bold faith and intense passion had now abandoned them in darkness and death. And I like, I did the God thing for a while and I I was like, but you know, like, their despair in that season can be observed in the response of one of the disciples who when asked about his thoughts on Jesus' crucifixion in Luke's gospel, chapter 24 says this, well, we had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. We had hoped. Yeah, look, I've walked with God and stuff and I had hoped that God would like help me out with this major thing and He just didn't, man. I I don't know. I'm not so like amped anymore, you know. Uh, I'd hoped that like following Jesus meant that he would give me that breakthrough, but the depression, it's still there. So uh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm deciding what I want now. How often have we hoped for things that God has seemed to just overlook? How often have we had this childlike faith at the beginning that's been lost? in the complexity of the human experience because of everything we had hoped for that didn't turn out quite the way we had wanted it to. At this stage, the disciples had hoped so much in their first love and his promises. And now all of that seemed lost. From the disciples' first love encounter, impressed and inspired by Jesus' miracles, they now entered this period of despair in which they drifted from their devotion to Jesus. But unknowingly, they would return to Jesus out of their despair. And when they did, things would be different in comparison to when they first met just like in the case of that sinful woman and her second return to Christ. You see, the disciples returned to a first love, but this time their first love would testify not of crucifixion, but of resurrection. Their first love would prove that he could be trusted no matter what the situation looked like, that he was sovereign, They returned to a first love that didn't need to prove his presence with them by removing their suffering, but which showed them that not even suffering could stop him. It's like, I thought the crucifixion had you. I thought it was done, but here you are. I return to you and I think differently. I see your power even when I'm struggling with situations and I'm not gonna fall away anymore because if you've done it through a crucifixion, I know you'll bring it to resurrection. They're suddenly returning to their first love and it's different. There's a deeper trust. There's a higher level of submission, a stronger sense of commitment and security, even in suffering. They return to a first love which had revealed how far man had fallen because of sin. Remember how far you've fallen. They returned to a first love which revealed how far man had fallen because of sin, expressed through the depth of Jesus' suffering as a substitute for them. And so just as he who is forgiven much loves much, 
Like the sinful woman Jesus spoke of, the disciples now knew great forgiveness through the cross and therefore returned to Jesus with an even greater love. You went through all that for me. And now I've returned to you in your resurrection power. You've shown me how deep and how far you would go for the distance I've fallen. You see, we don't return to our first love in shame because of how far we've fallen. We return to our first love in confidence because of how deeply we've been forgiven. That changes our mind. Wait, wait. Okay, so this isn't like a, oh, I've stuffed up and, and drifted far from my first love. This is not that. This is, oh my word. no matter how far I've gone, his forgiveness can never be out of reach. I'm going home. This is how we need to change our minds. You see, it's, it's not a religious law that demands we return. It's the invitation of God's great love. Our return to first love doesn't start by earning God's approval. It starts by accepting God's invitation. Hey, I, I don't even know how to land this because I don't wanna give you practical points. But maybe we need to just recognize as we leave today that that returning to my first love is not about earning God's approval. It's about accepting His great love. Maybe I need to this week as I go to work, just ponder that this is about accepting an invitation, not about earning approval. Maybe I need to, tomorrow as I drive to work, just acknowledge that and speak out to God and say, I accept your invitation, Jesus. I don't know how to do this. I don't know what the next step is. But even now in this moment, I, I accept your invitation. Help me navigate this. Jesus invites us to return to our first love. And all we need to do is accept it because he first loved us. And his words of invitation are written in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 of the New Testament. This is what he says. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Oh, the unforced rhythms of grace. Not the intense, weighty rules of religion. The unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you will learn to live freely and lightly. When we go into the week, I pray the Holy Spirit would keep reminding you that coming back to your first love is not something you earn. It's an invitation you accept. And I encourage you to in moments through the week without figuring out a strategy or what you're gonna do next to simply in those conscious moments say to Jesus, I accept your invitation, Jesus. I want to return to my first love. I accept your invitation. I don't know what I must do. That's okay. Let's keep exploring as God opens his word in this series. But, but just God, I accept your invitation. Here I am.